you have your Bible this morning, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4, and we are going to jump into the teaching this morning. I do have a lot to say, and you know, I really hope that you'll hang with me until the end, and you know, I don't speak on Wednesday night. Pastor Kevin does. He does an awesome job. And if you haven't been coming out on Wednesday night, I would encourage you to do so. We don't have Sunday night service here at Family Church. And so really, you know, Sunday morning, that's, that's, that's really my one and only shot to share with you uh, the things that God shares with me um, about you. And so uh, sometimes I know it might seem like it's a little long, but... Um, so hang with me this morning. So we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4 in just a moment. This is our fourth week in a series that I'm calling Growing Up. And we are learning about spiritual maturity and what it means to grow up in Christ instead of just growing up in church. And, you know, I've been praying over this series that it will cause you to take inventory of your life. And we're not going to put up the you are here sign today, but, you know, we've been talking about how the first step to spiritual maturity is getting gut level honest about where you are. And then once you figure out where you are, then you can figure out where you want to go. So you have all these things in your life where you want to grow, all these areas where you want to get better and where you want to uh, see your relationship with God just be more. And that's, that's really what, what growing up uh, in Christ is all about. And that's what this series is all about. So this week, I've been thinking a lot about filters. Now, people use filters on their social media photos to hide their flaws. Now, if you've ever done that, don't lift your hand, but we know who you are. <laughs> because with the right filter, you can change your appearance. You can even transform yourself into a dog and other various wild animals. My favorite is when someone posts a picture of themselves and it says something like this. Just me with no makeup, <laughs> sitting here by the river, eating salad out of a jar. <laughs> but you can obviously tell that the picture has been filtered. They're not wearing makeup, but they're wearing a filter. Stay with me. I ran into someone the other day that I'm Facebook friends with, but I didn't recognize them. <laughs> because when I met them in person, they were unfiltered. The Holy Spirit is working to help you get to a place of spiritual maturity so that you don't have to live your life behind filters. The person that you want to be is within reach. And you can get to the place where you don't have to hide your flaws behind filters because you've worked through them. You, you can live an unfiltered life. And if you use filters, I'm not making fun of you. Yes, I am. <laughs> that is completely up to you. I'm not about to get into that this morning, but... But the Holy Spirit wants to help you live in a way where you're unfiltered, where you're not just hiding behind, uh, you know, you're not just hiding behind uh, an image, where you're actually working through your issues and you're growing in your relationship with God. Doesn't that sound better? Yeah. Rather than hiding it, rather than, rather than masking it, rather than pretending that it doesn't exist, the Holy Spirit is helping you uh, to move through all of those things. And, and, and really, that's, that's why... We're talking about this. So I want to start with a scripture this morning, and then we're going to pick up where we left off last week. So we are in Ephesians chapter 4, and I'm going to start reading in verse 11, and we're going to read all the way down through verse 16. And it says, so Christ himself gave the, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, having become what? Mature. Mature. 
attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. And I just, I, I love those scriptures. And, and, and here in these verses, there are four things that we learn about spiritual maturity. And so I want to share these four things with you. And then we're going to jump right back into the life of Solomon, where we left off last Sunday morning. But first, four things about spiritual maturity found in Ephesians chapter four. Number one is this, God provides spiritual examples to help us learn how to be spiritual. Aren't you thankful for those? God provides us spiritual examples to help us learn how to be spiritual. And there's even a list here in the scripture. And we're gonna talk about each one of these briefly. First of all, he says God provides apostles. What is an apostle? Apostle is someone who is called to the entire body of Christ. Someone like Paul. Paul not only planted churches, but he wrote books. And guess what? We are still reading his books. We read some scriptures out of one of the books that Paul wrote. What was the book? Starts with E and ends with Ephesians. (laughs) Ephesians. We're still reading books that Paul wrote thousands of years ago because he's called to the entire body of Christ. So apostles, the second person on the list is prophet. A prophet can tell you what will happen before it happens. And I'll just say this, this last season that we have just gone through in America has certainly revealed many false prophets because prophecy is not wishful thinking and prophecy is not telling people what you think they want to hear. In fact, in the Old Testament, many times, more than the flip side, prophets would show up and tell people exactly what they didn't want to hear. And so a prophet, when you say, thus saith the Lord, you better get it right. Or you better just say, my opinion is. You follow me? And so I never say I prophesy. I always say I predict because then it's on me and not God. Don't be quiet. And so prophet is the next. The second or the third person on the list is evangelist. And an evangelist is a soul winner. When I think of an evangelist, I immediately think of Billy Graham. The greatest soul winner that has, my generation has ever known. Years ago, there was a man named Jonathan Edwards who would preach and the people would come to his meetings and they would hang on to the tent poles because they felt like their feet were slipping into hell. That guy had a soul winner's anointing. And there are many more. So I think of guys like Jonathan Edwards. I think of people like Billy Graham whenever I think of an evangelist. And then, and then the fourth is pastor. And this is a guy or, or a lady who, who shepherds a local church. And then five is teacher. This is someone who knows the word of God and can teach the word of God for others. Listen, you need people like this in your life to grow spiritually. You need people like this in your life to grow spiritually. You can have one of these gifts. You can have all of them or some of them. I tend to flow in four of them. Um, apostle, that's why, that's why I write books, because I feel a call to the body of Christ as a whole. Um, evangelist, because I have a desire to see people come to Christ. Pastor, because I feel like God has called me to shepherd a local church. And teacher, someone who uh, sometimes I feel like I really know the word, and sometimes I feel like I don't know it at all. Uh, but I tend to flow in, in four of those in four of those gifts. And so um, you need people like that in your life. If you want to grow spiritually, you have got to put yourself around spiritual people. And guess what? The church is a great place to find those people. Now, last week we were talking about King Jeroboam and how that he knew, he knew that if he could keep the people away from the temple or the church, 
that he could sway them away from following the camp commandments that were given to Moses. And so you need these people in your life. You need people in your life who have ministry gifts. And what did he say about ministry gifts? He said they were for the purpose of building up the body. He said they were to bring unity. He said they were to help people um, build their faith. He said the ministry gifts were there to help people become mature in Christ. And I'll go one step further. I know people who believe they have ministry gifts but they aren't plugged into a local body of believers. Listen, you can't do anything without a body, including have ministry gifts. And so don't tell me about your gifts until you tell me about the local body where you're serving because I don't care. Come on, smile at me, somebody. <laughs> you, how many of you got up this morning without a body? How many of you ate breakfast without a body? How many of you drove to church without a body? And you can't have ministry gifts without a body. Oh, don't stop me while I'm preaching good. <laughs> and so you need people in your life. You need people in your life who are spiritual examples. And then we have, we have a list and we could talk about that more, but we need to move on. Number two, the second thing that we learn about spiritual maturity from what Paul told, told us in Ephesians is this. He said, it's our knowledge of the Son of God that helps us to mature. This is easy. The more we know the Word of God, the more we know the Son of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 1 says that you grow in your knowledge of Christ through teaching. And so the more you hear the Word of God taught the more you know the Son of God. And as you know the Son of God, you're growing. Number three, the third thing we learn from this verse is this. Maturity helps us to no longer be spiritual infants. A spiritual infant is someone who is constantly tossed back and forth. And the scripture says there's someone who is easily deceived. You know, we have a new grandson He's here, his name is Judah, and I can make him believe that I have disappeared. <laughs> do you know how I do that? And he's just sitting there looking up like, oh my gosh, where did he go? <laughs> and then what do you do? And he's like, oh, he's still here. Okay, we're good. See, an infant can be, can be easily deceived, and so we have to grow to maturity so that we are not easily deceived. Number four, the fourth thing that he says in this verse about spiritual maturity is this. He says, a life that looks like Jesus is the goal. Sometimes we ask little kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? And if you're a Christian, the answer to that question is Jesus. You want to grow up into him. Are you with me? So what do you want to be when you grow up? Jesus. I want to grow up into him so that I can be like him. That's the goal. Now, all right, let's, let's pick up where we left off last week. Last week, we learned about how that people will try to affect your spiritual growth. We talked about King Jeroboam. We talked about Jeroboam's wife. And we learned that Jeroboam was openly trying to set those around him back spiritually. And his wife was doing the same thing, only she was doing it privately. And I want to go back just for a moment to that again, because I felt a little bit rushed last week. And so I want to look at those, um, those um, examples that I gave you one more time. So, so who is Jeroboam? Let's go ahead and put those back up. And if you didn't get a picture of that last week, this is an opportunity for you to take out your phone and snap a picture of that. So do we have that slide? Who is Jeroboam? No? Oh, we don't have it. Okay. Well, I'll just read those to you. Who is Jeroboam? And remember, we took, the, we took these straight from the scripture. Uh, we got it? Okay, now the next. Let's go to the next. Um, okay, someone who is openly trying to pull you out of church. Now, I, I want to stop right there. Because sometimes we look at that and we think about that being a person at the bar. 
But that can also be a person who's sitting beside you this morning because anytime you're complaining or criticizing your church to another person, whether you realize it or not, you are openly trying to pull them out of that church. And your relationship with your church is going to be just like every other relationship that you have in life. Sometimes you're going to think that it can't get any better, and sometimes you're going to think that it can't get any worse, but you're going to spend most of your time somewhere between the two. You following me? And so the church in the scripture is described many ways. It's described as being the the bride of of Christ. It's described as being the, the children of God. And so anytime you're criticizing your church, you're talking about God's wife and God's kids. Now, how many of you like it when people talk about your spouse and your kids? I won't slap you for much, but if you talk about my kids, you're probably going to get slapped. And then I'll pray for forgiveness. See how it works? So, put that back up. Leave it. Number two, someone who offers you something else to worship. Number three, someone who pollutes your faith. Number four, someone who offers a path that doesn't line up with the word. Number five, someone who convinces you that what they're offering you is good. Okay, now let's go to Jeroboam's wife. We're going to read those real quick this morning, and then we're going to... um, Move on. Jeroboam's wife, someone who wants something from you while hiding who they really are. Someone who underhandedly convinces you that you won't reap what you sow. Someone who displays false attitudes, feelings, and actions for their own benefit. Someone who dresses up evil and presents it to you as good. Someone who believes God can be fooled or mocked without consequences. Okay, so we went through all of those things. And, and you grow in maturity as you outgrow those who are trying to set you back spiritually. Now, that doesn't mean that you stop being their friend. It just means that you stop allowing your friendship with them to affect you spiritually. Okay, now let's move on. Today, we're going to move on and we're going to talk. So last week, you know, you got to outgrow the wrong people. And next, number, number one this morning, you must outgrow the wrong places. Is that important, John? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You must outgrow the wrong places. The wrong places can keep you from growing spiritually. Let's go back to King Solomon because we've been using him as our example. By the time Solomon became king, the children of Israel had already entered into Canaan, or you may have heard it called the Promised Land. And when they arrived, the Canaanites who lived there previously had built what they called high places. Now, just kind of get that term in your head this morning. They built high places. A high place was an altar where they made sacrifices to false gods, gods like Dagon, gods like Baal. And so the people of the true God, the God of Israel, were forbidden, according to the law of Moses, from even visiting those places, let alone participating in what was going on there. In 1 Kings chapter 3, it says that Solomon followed the Lord, except that he offered sacrifices and burned incense on the high places. So the question that I have for you this morning is this. Do you have high places? Do you have places that you still go even though you know that just by being there, it's stunting your spiritual growth? Think about it like this. In the Old Testament, anytime a godly king followed an ungodly king, the first thing that the godly king did was tear down the high places. On the flip side, anytime an ungodly king followed a godly king, the first thing that the ungodly king did is rebuild the high places. Wow. And the lesson is this. If you want to grow, 
then you have to guard where you go. If you want to grow spiritually, then you have to guard where you go. And if you think that I'm talking about a geographical location, then you have entirely missed the point. I'm not talking about Las Vegas. I hear they have $2 buffets there. I'd kind of like to go check that out. <laughs> I'm talking about those high places where you know that if you go, you're going to fall back into old patterns and get yourself locked in to wrong behavior. Do you have high places? Is there some place you go where it's like you slip out of the child of God that you are and it's almost like you become someone else? <laughs> Walmart? Is that what you said? Mm, mm, probably. <laughs> Maybe you should consider pick up the delivery part of that. We all know how that goes sometimes. I'm talking about those places where you know that if you go, you're going to fall back into old patterns. And until you get rid of your high places, you're not going to grow spiritually. And you're going to wonder why. And you're going to have a lot of questions for the, for the people around you who are growing spiritually. Is anybody hearing, hearing what I'm saying this morning? There's certain places that you can't go anymore. Not because, you know, not because it's about being there, but because it's about what it does to you spiritually as a child of God. And back when, back when I had my counseling practice, anytime someone came to me one, wanting to change a wrong behavior, I always started with three questions. When the behavior shows up, who are you with, what are you doing, and where are you? That's where we started. That was our baseline for every behavior. And, you know, you need to write that down. That's a free, that, that would have cost you 185 bucks an hour. <laughs> write that down. If I charged you, that's what I would charge you. <laughs> Some of you more. <laughs> Who are you with? What are you doing? Where are you? Where are you? It's so important that you identify those high places and you get rid of them. And then I would say something like this. You can't change your behavior until you challenge and change your actions. Are you ready to do that? Most of the time, the answer was, no, that's why I'm here. I, I'm not ready, or I haven't been ready, or I can't. So not only do you have to outgrow the wrong, the wrong people, but you have to outgrow the wrong places. Some of you know, some of you are sitting out there this morning, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. You have something on your calendar, and, and you want to go so bad but you know that if you go, it's going to set you back spiritually and you are so hating me right now. <laughs> Don't shoot the messenger. You have to outgrow your places. All right, number two. Number two, regardless of how you feel or where you are in this journey, God created you to grow to maturity. See, every plant that God ever planted, he planted it to grow to maturity. God didn't plant anything and say, you know what, you're just going to be a little peewee plant all your life. God, God, everything God ever planted, he planted with an eye to it growing up and being able to reproduce. And so no matter where you are, maybe you feel like you're just kind of getting started in this journey, or maybe, you know, you're like me and you've been in this thing for, you know, over three decades now, you know, wherever you are, God, God designed you, God designed you to grow to maturity. In first, or, um, I'm sorry, in second Peter chapter one and verse three, 
It says that God has given you everything that you need for life and godliness. And so if you're sitting around waiting to feel spiritual before you begin to pursue spiritual realities, you've waited too long. In Isaiah chapter 43, it says that God created you and formed you. And when I read that verse a few weeks ago, as I was putting all of this together, I had the revelation that God put just as much thought into you as he put into Adam and Eve. Man, that really changes things for me. And I want to share some of that with you this morning. That God put just as much thought into you as God put into Adam and Eve. That really brings Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 to life. Let's read it together. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 says, For we are God's worksmanship. Your translation may say, you are God's handiwork. It might even say that you are God's masterpiece. But it all means the same thing. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Man, I had some serious revelation about that verse. And I want to share that with you this morning. In fact, I'm going to teach out of that verse some tonight at the overflow service. But as you read Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, it says this, You are God's work. You are God's work. The person that I'm, tro- that the person that I'm trying to grow into, the person that you are trying to grow into, the scripture says, has already been prepared in advance. Think about that for a second. You are God's work prepared in advance to do God's work. Man, that is kind of life-changing. You are God's work prepared in advance to do God's work. And this is how I saw this in my mind. If you go to my parents' house... There are pictures of me from the time I was born until probably yesterday. Right, Mom? Okay, so if you walk into my parents' house, my mom has pictures. Some people have home interior. Some people have, you know, all these signs that say, like, live, laugh, and love and all that kind of stuff. But if you go into my mom's house, there are pictures everywhere of her children just and her grandchildren just, just everywhere. So if you go to my mom's house, there are pictures of me from the time I was born until now. But if you could see the walls at God's house, there would be pictures of me doing stuff that hasn't even happened yet because it's been prepared in advance. Are you as excited about that as I am? You should be because it's going to get about you in just a minute. When I was a little kid, running around in the woods of Wright County, God had a picture of Pastor Larry on his wall. God had the books that I've written in his bookcase before I ever wrote them. Why? Because it was prepared in advance for me to do. Now I'm going to talk about how you can get to that place in just a moment. And so I wonder what pictures of you are hanging on God's wall. I wonder what God has prepared in advance for you to do. And I'm not talking about building a global ministry. I'm talking about pictures of you being kind. I'm talking about pictures of you raising your kids in church. I'm talking about pictures of you being the light of Christ at your job. I'm talking about pictures of you forgiving your enemies even though you don't want to. I'm talking about pictures of you practicing biblical stewardship. I'm talking about pictures of you being an awesome grandpa. I'm talking about pictures of you serving on the dream team right here at Family Church. Because God has all these wonderful things that he has prepared in advance for you, some of which you will have to grow into, but you can do it. You can do it. There were many years of my life when I was not equipped to lead this place. Many years of my life when I was not equipped. I think, I don't know, I've written seven or nine books. I don't know, somewhere in there. Many years of my life 
I was not equipped to do those things, but guess what? God prepared those things in advance for me to do, and all I had to do was grow into it. All you have to do is grow into it. And man, it just breaks my heart when I see these people that used to be in church and they used to serve God and they used to love God and now they're not. And when I saw all that potential in them and knew the works that God had prepared in advance for them to do, but now they're not even in a position to be able to do those things. And so as you grow, you grow into the things that God has prepared in advance for you to do. The word, get this guys, the word workmanship in that verse is the Greek word poema. And it means this, it means something that is made, something that is crafted or fashioned together as a masterpiece. And it also means poetry. In fact, one translation that I found says this, you are God's poem. So you can either live trying to make your own life work or you can let your life become his work. Manship. A poem cannot write itself. A poem cannot lead itself. It must be written by an author. That means you follow his will above your own and his plan above your own. That means you allow his spirit to move through you and you allow his love to dominate you. Then your life will flow like it was meant to flow. Like a poem, there will be a rhythm and a beauty to your life. Why? Because you're God's work. So I can do my work or I can do God's work. I've done both. I'd rather do God's work. So as you grow, you, you, you literally become the person that God created you to be. And, I, and I'll give a little commercial. That's what I'm going to talk about tonight. I'm going to talk about how that your ability to create comes from the creator. And the closer you get to the creator, the more creative you become. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. And it's the same way in your spiritual life. God has prepared in advance things for you to do. And the closer you get to him and the more you grow spiritually, you actually not only grow up in Christ, but you grow up into the things that God has called you to do. That's the way that it works. Okay, next week, we're gonna talk about your calling. And so let's all stand. We're gonna close right there. We're gonna talk about we're going to talk about God's will next week and what it means to be in God's will. And we're also going to talk about your calling and how you find it and um, how to flow in it. So if that interests you, then I would encourage you to be here. But right now, let's pray. Lord, this morning, we thank you. We thank you because we are your work. We are your workmanship. We are your handiwork. We are your masterpiece. You have prepared in advance good works for us to do. And our job, really, as believers, as disciples, is to grow to the place to where we're ready. Just like a, a child, when a child is born, that child is not ready to ride a bicycle. And a, and a child who's riding a bicycle is not ready to drive a car. And a person who drives a car is not ready to fly a plane. And that's, you know, that's kind of the way I see it in my spiritual life. It's what I grow, as I grow up, then, then I also grow out into whatever you have put inside of me to do. And so right now in this moment, I want you to just ask the Holy Spirit what he is saying to you about this teaching. You know, we talked today and last week some about how the, the wrong people will try to bend you. And this morning we talked about high places, how that a godly king would come and tear down the high places. An ungodly king would rebuild the high places. There are high places, places where you know that if you go, it's going to set you back spiritually. It's not going to make you more like Christ. It's going to make you less like Christ. It's going to put temptation in front of you that you may or may not succumb to. It's going to create uh, just some confusion inside of you, a war inside of you. And, you know, if you have those, I want you to begin to talk to God about those 
right now, in this moment this morning, you don't have to wait. You can begin to ask God to, maybe you need to identify that. You know, high place can be a place that you go to in your mind. It doesn't have to be a geographical location. It, it can be a place that you go to in your mind. And you know that if you go there, you're going to get mad. You're going to get upset. It's going to create all kinds of havoc. It's not going to make you m more like Jesus. It's going to make you slam doors and yell at your spouse and take it out on people that aren't even involved. Or it could be a place. It could be a place from your past where you used to, you know, be involved in things that honestly look nothing like Jesus and yet you still go. You still put yourself in that environment all the time and it affects you spiritually. And then you wonder why you don't grow. Listen guys, I want you to grow up into the person that God, the, the picture of you that God has on his wall, that's who I want you to grow up into. Where's DJ? Come here. Man, I appreciate this guy. When I met him, he was singing in bars. And his family was about gone. But God had a picture of him on his wall and he was standing right there. And he was singing right here. And I'm just sick of all the potential being sucked out of people. You can go. I'm sorry if I embarrassed you. You have got to grow up into the person God created you to be. Or you can just complain about who you are forever. There's so much potential locked up inside of you. And if you could see the walls at God's house and you could see the pictures of you that are, that are on God's wall, pictures of you leading people to Christ, pictures of you teaching people about Jesus, pictures of you being kind, pictures of you being forgiving, forgiving. and you have to grow up into those things. And it's time for you to do that. I want to ask the prayer team to come forward this morning and you know first of all if you're here today and you don't know Christ we want you to know Christ we want you to know this Jesus that has prepared in advance good works for you to do we want you to come out of darkness and into light and you can do that right here this morning you can invite Jesus Christ into your heart. You can ask Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins. And guess what? He will. And that's where it starts. And then, you know, there's some other things to figure out, but that's what we're here to help you do. And so if you're here today and you don't know Christ, if you don't feel like that your sins are forgiven, if you don't feel like that, if you were to die today, that you would go to heaven, we want you to come and we want to pray with you and for you. And we want you to help you. We want you to help you to find this Jesus. If you're here today and you're struggling to grow up, you're struggling. I mean, it is such a battle for you. Maybe you've got some wrong people. Maybe you've got some wrong places. And you're ready to grow past some of that stuff. You're ready to grow up and become that person who God has a picture of on his wall. I'm so thankful that when I go to my mom's house, the pictures don't stop at five years old. They continue to progress right on through to kids and now grandkids. And you can see, you can see my growth pattern. If you go to her house, you can see my growth pattern all the way through. And I think that's the way, I think that's the way God's walls are. Like you, he can see our growth pattern all the way through. And he just wants you to keep growing. And if you're struggling with that this morning, then we want to pray for you today.
and we want to believe God with you, then you're going to grow past some of that junk and you're going to move on in your walk. So guys, let's go ahead. Let's sing. And if you're here and you need prayer for that or for any other reason, then we would love to pray for you as well.